So please be patient, but you're having fun talking, so please go ahead. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Can we please get started? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it, uh, I'm Sam Menkoff, a chairman of the uh, chairman, <laughs> chancellor of the university, and it's <laughs> it's my distinct honor to uh, welcome you to Rhode Island Hall to begin a very very special weekend as we celebrate the lives of Chancellor Emeritus. Artemis A. W. Joukowsky, Jr., and Professor Emerita Martha Sharp Joukowsky. In tonight's panel event entitled Leading by Example and Inspiring a Generation of Female Archaeologists, we'll hear about Martha's lasting impact in archaeology from some of her amazingly accomplished former students, which, uh, which calls to mind a remark that Henry Adams made long ago that, that great teachers can attain a a kind of immortality because one never knows where their influence ends and for the most inspiring it can radiate out for generations and, and so it is for Martha. Tomorrow at the Brown Harvard football game we'll, we'll honor Artie's passion for Brown athletics and uh, just as he would have we'll be cheering loudly for a Bears victory. <laughs> Even louder than usual I suspect for Artie. I, I want to extend a, a special welcome to the members of the Joukowsky family who are joining us today, and I, I also want to recognize those who have uh, joined us on the live stream. Artie and Martha were brilliant examples of the deep connections that bind us together as lifelong Vernonians. Brown was an essential element, an inseparable element of, of who they were from their days as students here, to Martha's impactful teaching and research, to Artie's inspiring leadership on the corporation. <laughs> when Martha and Artie were awarded honorary degrees from Brown in 1985, Martha's citation recalled her unfailing dedication to Brown from her days at Pembroke to her fundraising for the library and her distinction teaching one of Brown's most popular undergraduate courses. The citation concluded that Martha was the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> Artie's citation referred to him as one of the wonders of today's world for Brown University. By the time I joined the Brown Corporation in 2003, Artie was a legend many times over. He was by then Chancellor Emeritus and a cherished friend and mentor who I often looked to for advice when I later became Chancellor. Artie was relentless in encouraging Brown to always aim higher in all that it did in its pursuit of truth, excellence, knowledge and service to society, and support for our student athletes. His leadership was always grounded in character and values, and he made every one of us who served with him on, on the corporation the better for it. He elevated the university and each of us along with it. I'm honored and humbled to be a part of this weekend and to pay tribute to Artie and, and Martha's memory. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to President Paxson, who I know feels just as strongly about Artie and Martha's extraordinary legacy at Brown. Please join me in welcoming President Paxson. Th thank you, Sam, and good afternoon to everybody who's here and everybody who's joined us on the live stream. Thank you for coming to honor and celebrate the contributions and lives of two of Brown's most ardent, dedicated, virtuous, interesting, funny community members and lifelong ambassadors. They were amazing people. So this weekend, we pay tribute to the outstanding impact of Artemis Artie Joukowsky and Martha Sharp Joukowsky. And they were, from everybody in this room, I believe, cherished friends and valued mentors, and they exemplified virtue and character and devotion. And, you know, as Sam mentioned to our community, they, they really exemplified, they represented the best of Brown in their incredible generosity, in their fierce loyalty, and their never-ending commitment to elevating Brown and its mission of research and education and service. So this weekend's events, we're beginning with this afternoon's panel, concluding with a celebration at tomorrow's football game. I do believe that we have a better chance of winning because it's in honor of Artie and Martha. 
And we're going to have an opportunity to reflect on the breadth of their contributions to uh, the Brown community. And I think it's important, you know, here we are in this institute, which was so important to them, but to reflect on the fact that their impact isn't just here on the campus, it's everywhere across the campus. Uh, professorship, scholarship, so many other initiatives. They advance work at Brown in archaeology, but also in medicine and in athletics and in the arts and, and so much more. Really fantastic. Be, now, before I share a bit more about uh, Artie and Martha, I want to take a moment to recognize the many individuals who contributed to putting this weekend together. And first and foremost, I want to recognize the members of the Joukowsky family who have joined us or soon will be joining us. I know uh, there's been some travel delays, but I want to thank them for sharing their parents with this university. I also want to acknowledge Peter Van Dommelen, who is director of the Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology, his great leadership of the institute, as well as everyone at the institute who contributed in putting to, to, together today's panel. And of course, all of our panelists who've joined us for this afternoon. I want to thank Grace Calhoun, Vice President for Athletics and Recreation, for her leadership. Many of you, if you don't know her, will have a chance to meet her tomorrow, as well as everyone in the Division of Athletics and Recreation who contributed to tomorrow's game, and the staff across the university, including events and communications and so much more, have contributed to these events. So before we get started, I, I just want to say a few words about Artie and Martha. And I think, as all of you know, their joint story began right here on College Hill more than 65 years ago. Artie at Brown, Martha at Pembroke, and like many true Brunonians, they, they, when they graduated, they left Providence. They went away. They went on to lead incredible lives of usefulness and reputation. And together, they traveled the world following Artie's career in international business and in Martha's great career as an archaeologist doing excavations in Lebanon and Hong Kong and so many other places. And I find it impossible to talk about one without also talking about the other. They were that inseparable. That was the case when they returned to Providence, and we were very fortunate they did in the 1980s, and further elevated their devotion and service to Brown. At every university, there are alumni who have the generosity and the philanthropic vision that are truly extraordinary. And without Artie and Martha, Brown would not be where it is today. I really believe that to be true. They lived and breathed Brown's mission of academic excellence. They were ambassadors for the university throughout their lives. And they just you know, were generous and optimistic, and they spread the breast to Brown no matter where they were in the world. So for Artie, I think as all of you know, and Sam mentioned, this included many years of very distinguished service on the, uh, on the corporation, eventually as chancellor. His role co-founding the Brown University Sports Foundation, which is still going strong. He chaired the Public Art Committee, which is something I hadn't even realized. And of course, we all remember his steadfast presence on the sidelines of football games, sometimes at practices, where he could always be found cheering on the Bears. And for Martha, it was through her unending dedication to her students in more than 20 years as a professor of archaeology. She not only conducted impactful field work and contributed to research and writing in the area, she trained a generation of archaeologists. And she was an advocate for women in archaeology and paved the way for women to succeed in this field, as evidenced by the panel that we have here today. I should add that their impact extended well beyond just the fields of archaeology or the areas of sports or in terms of their impact with students. I, you know, I've talked to a lot of Brown alumni, and I'm always, initially I was surprised, and then after a while I wasn't surprised, when a student who was, had nothing to do with archaeology would come up to me and say, when I came to Brown, Artie and Martha's home became my second home. Often they were international students, uh, people who you know, needed a place to go for Thanksgiving, a place to stay when they were recovering from jet lag, and really became just part of the family, became adopted. And that's also a legacy that I think is worth uh, remembering. 
Now, Artie and Martha worked closely with a number of Brown presidents, starting with Howard Swearer, who was president when Artie uh, came onto the corporation in 1985. And their relationship with Brown presidents fortunately continued for a long time, and I was a beneficiary of that. I will always be so grateful for their warmth and generosity and the welcome that they gave to me and my husband, Ari, when we moved to Providence, and just the wise advice and encouragement that I received from both of them over the years. I have fond memories of uh, numerous long dinners, uh, some nice teas at their home and at our home, always wonderful. I loved hearing stories about their families uh, on both sides, really incredible parents, extraordinary family histories. I loved hearing stories about their times traveling abroad, whether it was, you know, Artie's adventures in international fundraising with Howard Swearer. I think they were part of one of Brown's earliest and most successful campaigns, a and also their work on Diggs and Petra and so many other places. One of Artie and Martha's outstanding contributions is seen right here in the establishment of the Artemis A.W. and Martha Sharp Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology and the Ancient World. The institute was established in 2004. It supported students and faculty conducting research in locations around the world and contributed to the education of so many Brown students, and this will continue for years to come. So it's, it's quite a legacy. Tonight, I'm pleased to announce that in tribute to their memory, Brown is establishing the Martha Sharp and Artemis A.W. Joukowsky Memorial Fieldwork Fund to provide additional support for undergraduate students participating in fieldwork and practical archaeology work across the world. So. So now let, let's get on to today's program, and we are so honored to be joined by several of Martha's former students who will share with us their personal reflections of Martha's mentorship and how she inspired them in their work today. I'd like to introduce Laurel Bistock, Associate Professor of Archaeology and Egyptology. Laurel conducts research on the material culture of the Nile Valley and the methodology of archaeological recording. She also has the very important responsibility currently of being the university's mace bearer. And so at, at commencement, she's the one holding this staff that protects me in case there are any sheep in the way or whatever. I don't know what it's for, but it's quite great. Uh, it, it, being a mace bearer, she must have a degree from Brown University. That's the one of the requirements. So she is an AB from Brown and a master's degree and a PhD from NYU. So please join me in welcoming Laurel. Thank you very much. Just for the record, that was the first time Chris and I have ever kissed each other three times on the cheek. <laughs> Many people understand what that means. It took me years to get used to the three. I, don't, I never really got used to the three. I used to fumble, how many kisses is it supposed to be? And can I dodge the cigarette while we're kissing each other's cheeks with Martha? Um, so thank you so much, uh, Chris, for, for welcoming <clears throat> my intrusion of that, that uh, piece of Martha into this. It was a good beginning. I, I have drafted remarks today. I don't usually speak from a draft at all, and I, I think I will try not to. I drafted remarks because I was nervous. This matters so much to me to be able to speak of my, my mentor and later friend, Martha, in this room full of happiness and sadness. Of, of so many people who have so many memories to bring together, I, I wanted to do her justice. And uh, one of my colleagues, our, our newest a professor in the Joukowsky Institute who never had the, the pleasure to meet Martha in person, told me this morning that I didn't need to worry about it because my every day does justice to Martha. And that made me cry <laughs> and made me realize that actually I'm going to try and put my, my text away. I'm going to kiss Chris. I'm going to put a picture of Martha kissing uh, someone in Jordan up. 
And I'm going to use my time in front of you rather to tell stories. Who could be in the orbit of the Joukowskis without gathering stories? Who cannot, in hearing our stories, there are personal stories. I will tell you of myself in telling you of Martha, and you will hear in my stories things that remind you of you and how she helped you grow too. And so that is with many tears, and I'm also paving the way for all of you guys to cry and tell <laughs> stories cry. too. I'll cry. Um, tell some stories of Martha, and I didn't <clears throat> handpick necessarily which ones I would say, so there may, there, I will surprise myself in the next 10 minutes as well. I'm going to start with a story about a story. Natasha, this one's totally for you. If you weren't here, I wouldn't tell this story. But it's, 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 we're going to not go in any sort of chronological order. This is in many ways one of my most recent Martha stories, and it starts in a classroom full of undergraduate students, which is appropriate when we talk about how much we love Martha. So I teach a class on uh, an introductory class for archaeological methods and questions. And we rewrote this class a couple of years ago. It has, in fact, as its origin, a class that Martha used to teach with sandboxes in the basement of 70. I'm getting so many nodding heads right now. <laughs> right. So this class has gone through several evolutions. Uh, Sue Alcock pioneered a new version of it. I taught it for many years out of this room. And most recently, I've been teaching it, co-teaching it with uh, a colleague in anthropology to try and think about new ways we can think about this. Well, so last year, we were teaching this class. And I wanted to give an example early in the class of how different stakeholders, different communities have different relationships to the artifacts of the past. And it's about understanding the multiplicity of avenues of knowledge and appreciation uh, that we can best understand the history of archaeology and the questions that we ourselves are trying to address. <laughs> I have to not look at you, Natasha. Um, so I told a story about I, I told a story in a class of undergrads about a graduate class I had taught a few years ago at Brown where I had been introducing my grad students to the, the art of ancient Egypt in New England collections. And we had gone around to different museums and met with curators and met with conservators and heard about the collections of great art in, in New England. And we ended the class by going to a collection of Egyptian art in a private collection. And my students' minds were totally blown. This is the grad students. I'm telling the undergrads about the grad students now. So we'd been going to these museums and hearing about uh, conservation and the millions of dollars uh, and, and months of planning that went in for moving one statue of one king from one floor of the MFA to another. And then we get to this private collection. And we get there, and, and the, the uh, couple who are showing us their collection, and as I said, I did not name them. I said, you know, they had stopped collecting years ago when it became uh, ethically problematic in the 70s. And, and it was, she wanted to be ethically correct, and he wanted to please her. Uh, and, uh, but they had kept much of their collection. And, and we went to their house, and I was you're going to get to see how people who bought this stuff in Egypt actually interact with their artifacts. And we walk in the door. <clears throat> There's dogs everywhere. They're pulling antiquities off the wall to pass around to my students who are like, what do we do? <laughs> they, they had made, they, I have to remember not to use <clears throat> personal names. I didn't at that point. They made a gooey chocolate cake. We were there balancing chocolate cake on our knees with antiquities and cigarettes and dogs. And this after the, 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 the months of being in museums and hearing about a million dollars to move a statue from, from one place to the other. It was the most eye-opening, great experience I've had in a seminar for a long time. And I love telling this story. And I thought I did it really well. My students really got that, OK, we're talking about indigenous ways of knowing. We're talking about museums. We're also talking about changes in the way private ownership of antiquity has happened in, in the United States. <clears throat> After class, a student comes up to me and says, I know who you were talking about. <laughs> oh, no. My name's Natasha Joukowsky. <laughs> <laughs> I turned absolutely beet red. Um, but Natasha came to my office multiple times that semester, and we told stories about Martha to one another. If this is one of my most recent stories, and thank God it shows me that the Joukowsky family and my love of them will continue to be parts of my life and, and my classroom, uh, my early stories of Martha go, go way back. Now I'm going to cry again. Um, I stand before you as a 
an associate professor of Egyptology and archaeology, and by courtesy, an associate professor of history of art and architecture. It's a ridiculous title. I'm very sheepish about it. Martha was very proud of it. Um, that's not how I came to Brown. I came to Brown in 1995 as a, a shy 18-year-old from the West Coast with two suitcases and no parents accompanying me. And I remember standing outside Andrew's dorm before moving in. I simultaneously was deeply scared and really sure I had found where I belonged. I wanted to come to Brown uh, because they had an Egyptology department and because they had an archaeologist I wanted to work with. I had seen documentaries on TV of Martha and Petra, and I came here because I wanted to work with her. Brown at that time did not have uh, any Egyptian archaeologist, in fact. So this is, this, it looks like a through narrative in my life from 18-year-old wanting this to being back in, it's, it's not quite so straightforward as that, as no, no narrative life is. Martha is mine, anybody's. Um, but that was already something I wanted. And my shy self, I remember my second semester at Brown, I <clears throat> took a class from Martha. It was my first class. I was... I steeled myself the second week of class to go up to her after class and say, Professor Jakowski, may I go to Petra with you? <clears throat> she said, no. <laughs> she said, no, I don't take freshmen into the field. But why don't you come to the house and have lunch this weekend and we can talk? If that, I mean, it was terrifying asking her. It was terrifying, but also a relief to be told no. It was terrify terrifying to be invited to the house. Um, we weren't at three kiss, kiss stage yet, uh, but, but that was my first entry into the house from which I would steal at least 50% of the cigarettes I've ever smoked. Um, and I went to the house, and Martha cooked lunch. Cooked. It was, I don't remember what it was. It was either a PB&J or an omelet. And Martha made lunch. Um, and we talked, and she asked about what I had done and what I wanted to do. And that was, that was the beginning. That was... Me, my terribly shy self, I am still terribly shy. Uh, like Martha, I love being on this stage because I love my students, but I keep a large part of myself reserved as well. They go together, I think, in being able to teach. I worked with her very closely throughout the time. I was an undergraduate. I was in Petra for three seasons. I survey, I remember when you were like, <laughs> Tiny. My kids are substantially larger than you were when I met you now. <laughs> my kids, I met my, my ex-husband who is here with whom uh, we have two lovely children. We met in Petra. He was the illustrator for years for Martha as well. She uh, gave him a job designing one of, of her books, the publications uh, from Petra. So my undergraduate life is really interwoven um, with that house, with Martha, as, as for so many of us. In fact, I don't remember her commenting much on my work. I don't remember her being a major part of my, my coming up with questions and my, my intellectual journey. What I remember over and over is that she gave me the space, the opportunity to find things, quite literally, to find things. She said no. And then she made lunch to tell me over lunch that she had found a way to take me. She had already figured it out by the time I came for lunch. She had found a donor to pay for it. And she took me to Petra as a freshman. She took me the next two summers as well. I was a trench supervisor at 20, given, given control, given strategic control over a trench and, and the opportunity and, and responsibility to teach other students how to excavate. It was decades before I understood what an honor that was that being a trench supervisor is not something that just happens. It was not a title we had in Petra. It was just a role. She asked me to play and expected that I could and then stood back and let me do it. Likewise, I remember one of the things I excavated in Petra, I found sort of a cache of, um, of broken Nabataean pots. It was amazing. And I remember one night gluing these pots back together, gluing pottery back together. The glue is totally toxic, and it makes you completely high. And I undoubtedly got over some, I also, I wasn't always shy in the field in Petra. I'm sure I was extremely obnoxious. I don't see some of the people who had to put up with me as an undergraduate in the field. But I turned to Martha while I was gluing pots together, and I said, someone should publish this. It's amazing. And she said, yeah, you're going to publish it. 
because I, I, I'm sure many of you again can can relate this sort of this this sort of slap of generosity that you get that's just so huge that you don't know what to do with it, but that's also a little bit disengaged, right? I published it. We didn't publish it together. I applied for graduate school with a solo authored, peer reviewed publication of important stuff from an important site. And again, she never made a big deal out of giving that to me. It took me ages to know how special that was. She wasn't always pleased with me. She could make me blush well into my 40s by strategically retelling a story about how badly I embarrassed her when the Minister of Antiquities came to the house unexpected, right, so many of you have even heard this story and not from me, uh, came to the house one day and, you know, a shy teenager with two suitcases full of stuff can make a lot of a mess. My room was a disaster. And the minister asked for a, a, a tour of the house <laughs> and took Martha to town based on the state of my room. Um, in my nervousness today, I came early to campus to clean my office in the Joukowsky <laughs> Institute in honor of Martha. There are multiple through lines from my time in Martha's mentorship and now. Um, any undergraduate who's taken a class with me knows that I take my undergraduate seriously. That's not a decision I make. I was taken seriously as an undergraduate. Uh, I don't choose that to pay forward what Martha gave me. On the contrary, it gives its own rewards and it is so baked into me because that's what I received myself. You mentioned that I work on digital recording. My, my knowledge of the importance and structure of archaeological recording, again, it was never hammered into me. It was simply something that was done in Petra and has been an interest of mine ever since, as I've seen how badly it is done in some other places and how much better we can make it. So these, these through lines are there, even though, again, not an arc necessarily, not a, not a narrative. Martha didn't make me. She gave me the incomparably greater, greater gift of creating spaces over and over again in which I could make myself. This is one of them that bears her name. She never told me how to be a professor here. I never tried to be like her. She was proud of me because I did that much more difficult to define thing that she did and welcomed others to her place. I miss her terribly, but I'm so glad that I've had her. And I know, and now I'm crying right now, and I will, I will turn the mic over uh, to our next speaker, our next storyteller, I'm pretty sure. Um, please join me in welcoming, <clears throat> wait, who's next? We're not in order. No. Yeah, okay, oh my god, that threw me off there for a second. Okay, Emily, <laughs> please come and share your memories. As your program will tell you, Emily Catherine Egan is Assistant Professor of Ancient Eastern Mediterranean Art and Archaeology in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at the University of Maryland and a former student of Martha's. Thank you. That is going to be rough to follow. <laughs> Laurel, okay. Um, I too suffer from the three kiss problem. I think I've accidentally made out with more people than I would like to admit <laughs> by missing the direction of the first kiss. Um, I am Emily Egan. It's really a, an honor to be here today and to be able to speak. Can everyone hear me? Um, in honor of a woman who made a tremendous impact on me and of whom I think about constantly. Um, I, too, will tell stories. I'm not as brave as Laurel. I'm going to stick to my script, because if I don't, I might not make it through. When I arrived at Brown in 1998, I wanted to be a Latin teacher or an actress. <laughs> Needless to say, I changed my mind, and that is due, as are many of the best things that have happened to me in my life, to Martha. I'll admit that I received a bit of a warning that she might have this kind of power over me. My aunt and uncle had met the Joukowskis in Jordan in the mid-90s and had told me that they were a force of nature. If I had any interest at all in the ancient world, they said, I should seriously consider going to Brown. 
I did go to Brown, and while I was there, I enrolled in Martha's Archaeology of Anatolia class my very first semester. Over the next three years, I took every class she offered, Archaeology of Iran, Archaeology of Palestine, Museum Ethics and Collection Policies, and the list goes on. In the classroom, Martha opened a new world for her students, one that wove together history, language, and things, a heady mix that captivated us and made the past come alive. It was not the subject alone that was the draw, but Martha's descriptions, her commanding voice, and her passion. She talked not just of objects, but of dirt, of dust, of discovery. She also spoke of the modern populations who lived in and around archaeological remains, and the delicate balance between preserving the past and sustaining the present. I will always remember something she told me while I was working with her in Petra. Miss M, she said, using the nickname she devised for me, people matter. This made a distinct impression and was reinforced daily by her interactions with our local workmen whose welfare she cared for very deeply. In both the field and the classroom, Martha gave the same care and attention to her students, investing in their lives as well as their academic performance. She always asked how I was, not something about in which my other professors seemed too interested. I distinctly remember on September 11th, 2001, her making the unusual decision to hold class not to lecture, but to give us space to be together and to talk about what we are experiencing in the moment. Today I employ the same tactic in my own classroom. How are you? Is something I ask my students regularly, encouraging them to see the human side of their studies and not to shy away from connecting their modern lives with past experience. Martha also trusted me and pushed me to have a strong point of view, even as an undergraduate. It was never too early in her mind to start thinking and doing. College was not a stepping stone, but a place to do real work. As the advisor of my honors thesis, she was formidable and demanding. I had chosen as a topic the wall painting program from the South Corridor of the Petra Great Temple, which I had excavated together with Emma Libinati, who's back there, in 2001. Every draft I turned in, like every piece of work Martha edited, was returned to me absolutely covered in red ink. <laughs> Her comments peppered with little reminders about turns of phrase that were unacceptable. Walls, she pronounced, do not run. I don't think it was until late in graduate school that anyone, again, put so much energy into editing my work. That thesis was the first substantial piece of archaeological research I ever did and became, with Martha's encouragement, the basis of my first article, like Laurel, published just after graduation. Today, my work continues to revolve around wall painting, um, but uh, though in Greece, not in Jordan. While the material I study is nearly a thousand years older than the Petra Corpus, the way I approach plaster fragments has changed very little, and I have Martha and her flurries of red ink to thank for that intensive early training. After college, Martha helped me develop my skills as an illustrator, skills I use regularly in my current projects. For two years, I worked for her, hand inking drawings of artifacts and architectural fragments from the Petra Great Temple in preparation for the site's final publication. Eight hours a day, five days a week, I would draw in the basement of 79 Prospect Street with episodes of PBS adaptations of Agatha Christie's Poirot playing in the background. Every day at 5 p.m. sharp, Martha would come down, scotch in one hand, cigarette in the other, to inform me that the workday was over. Her beloved dogs, Meffy and Dushara, would follow her dutifully, and on occasion, the four of us, and anyone else who happened to be in the house that day, would relocate to the upstairs living room, painted the most vivid Pompeian red, to talk. In these conversations, you weren't allowed to just sit there quietly and listen, which is what I wanted to do. Active participation was expected, and more importantly, appreciated. Martha's basement was for me and many other students a very special place. Lined with books, appointed with plush pink couches and papered with accents of Egyptian wallpaper, the space contained a precious device, a slide projector. In those days, PowerPoint had not yet taken hold and reviewing for archeological exams typically necessitated a trip to the art building where one would view objects in tiny format by placing slides on a light table in the hallway. Knowing this, Martha provided a place for her students to view slides at size. 
We would all cram into her basement for the 24 to 48 hours prior to each exam to click through carousels as a class, nibbling on the peanut M&Ms that filled every bowl in the house, and ordering pizza or falafel to sustain us into the wee hours. During these sessions, Martha would always make an appearance, answering our many questions and providing infusions of energy when our eyelids drooped. Today, I marvel at how absolutely unthinkable this arrangement would be to most people. <laughs> Professors, being one myself, typically want to go home to peace and quiet, not have their students follow them home, and bother them with annoying questions at all hours of the day. Martha was utterly unparalleled in this regard, making her home and her brain available to us virtually 24-7 in a way that made it clear how sincerely she cared about us and her studies, our studies. I like to think of my office at Maryland as my version of Martha's basement. There may not be slides, but there are snacks, and the door is always open. In the basement of 79 Prospect and in its upstairs pantry, where coffee was always brewing, lifelong friendships were forged. In my case, Martha also found me a husband. After my sophomore year, she encouraged me to participate in an archaeological field school at Pompeii, run by Jarrett LaBelle, who's also here, which is where I met Chris Cloak, who is somewhere here, chasing our three-year-old daughter around. <laughs> Um, the next summer in Petra, we fell in love. Nearly 10 years later, when he proposed, Martha was the first person I called. Martha! I exclaimed. Chris and I are engaged! That's fabulous! She said. Put Chris on! I dutifully handed him the phone. Chris! She said. What the hell took you so long? <laughs> well put, I thought. But that was Martha. Commanding yet approachable, intimidating yet magnetic. I think these combinations are why so many of us rallied to her side and never left. Her management style made you want to work for her and her personality made you want to be her. She also made you laugh. MSJ whimsy is a phrase that all of her students know. Martha coined it for herself and it captured her to a T. Here was a living contradiction, a brilliant scholar on the one hand and a lover of schlocky animatronic animals on the other. She had, I think, at least 50 such creatures in her home office, many provided by her students, most notoriously Tarek Kanashat, sitting over there, who I should also add was instrumental in the um, establishment of the new Brown Fund for undergraduates. A fish that sang, hamsters that danced, a donkey that dispensed cigarettes in a most unusual manner, and an ostrich that pumped its legs to the tunes of a carnival. In the kitchen, she used her toaster oven as a bread box and gave it to me when I left for graduate school. You're the only person who ever turned it on, she said. <laughs> in the classroom, one of her most memorable slides was of a Big Mac and a cardboard carton. This, she said, is the Neolithic Revolution. Cattle, crops, containers. I use this slide every year in my own classes, and unlike my references to 90s pop culture, it never ages or fails to land. In the field, Martha's humor was notoriously wry. One summer, while Martha was briefly away from the excavation, we found a peanut-shaped piece of sandstone in the dig office and turned it into Mr. Peanut with a Sharpie and some Q-tips. When we proudly showed our handiwork to Martha upon her return, she didn't miss a beat, deadpanning, you idiots, that was a Neolithic mother goddess figurine. <laughs> All the blood immediately rushed out of her faces <laughs> until Martha cracked a smile and informed us that it was, in fact, just a rock. <laughs> Martha was an incredible person. She was intensely invested in her work and she was intensely invested in people. She treated us, her students, like capable scholars and real adults, even when we were far from mature. She trusted us and she forced us to live up to that trust. She encouraged us and supported us with the warmth and fire of family. She is irreplaceable but lives on through the stories that we all continue to tell about her and in the way that we take her MSG whimsy and her MSJ humanity and try our best to pay it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next set of crying eyes is <laughs> Angela Hussein, who is here as the author of the Ask Dr. Dig, Everything You Need to Know About Archaeology, uh, and as a longtime friend of the Dikowski family. 
You get the three kisses too from the handle. No. Okay. Uh, Joukowsky Institute, um, thank you for asking me here. It's so good to be back in Providence. Um, my husband and I spent so many happy times here while we were doctoral students. Um, we have so many good friends and it's been a long time. Um, thanks especially to Sarah Sharp and Peter Van Dommel for making this possible for me to be here. Um, in some way, I wish the circumstances were happier. I wish Martha was here with us. I cannot think of a better person to bring us all together to celebrate. Um, I'll start cliched and say that Martha Sharp Joukowsky was many things to us. She was a teacher, a boss, a mentor, a famous archaeologist, so much besides. But I remember her most of all as a true friend. Out of all the lessons she taught us, this is the one that I most took to heart, be a friend. I remember Martha used to use the phrase, peace in our time, as a greeting or goodbye, in that she expressed a wish for a world with more friendship and compassion. I found that inspiring that um, she, someone like her, wished for something so worthwhile. Many of us here count ourselves lucky enough to have been among her friends. Um, that is what I valued most in all of her lessons, is how to be a friend. The world of academia can be competitive and stressful, but she was there for us, our friend, coming through time after time, helping those that might be living without heat some winter, or uh, needed a meal, or a loan of a car if you didn't have a reliable one. Um, it wasn't just having her there and being able to visit or correspond, but that she was someone with whom you could be at ease and honest about your struggles. And the joy she took in our triumphs, there was nothing nicer to see. Uh, Martha and I first met in 1998 when I started graduate school at Brown. Um, we had never met before, but I'd, I'd read about the department and during the application process, so I, I knew her name. Her resume inspired a bit of awe. Um, I was new and overwhelmed by all the things that everyone here seemed to know already. The world of Brown was not in my previous range of experience. Um, but I saw a poster on the first day of classes announcing that Professor Joukowsky was giving a convocation for the start of the year, so I went to hear her speak. Um, she was welcoming the new students, and she talked about her life at Brown and her career, um, meeting the love of her life on the campus, and how her life had grown here. Um, I didn't know what to expect from my future years, but uh, never knowing that this, this place would be the start of my career, um, where I would meet the love of my life and, and grow. Um, so I went up to her after the, um, after the convocation. I introduced myself. Uh, Martha invited me over to her house for lunch. Uh, it was just the two of us talking about our mutual passion of archaeology, and she gave me lots of advice. Um, she talked about people to contact and all kinds of things to read. She was so generous with her time. Um, she had so many years more experience, and, but she would talk to me like a person. Um, she didn't talk down to me, which you know, can often happen in a professor-student relationship. Um, she never set the dynamic with her above me, but she was actually gifting me with her attention. Um, she helped me navigate the first years, uh, was always very kind to the graduate students, asking questions and wanting to know about us. As a result, she knew things that other professors didn't know. Um, she knew what we were all interested in and what we cared about, um, what stage we were in in our studies. Uh, we'd see her at lectures and classes, um, and then finally in her years uh, as director of the um, Center for um, Old World Archaeology and Art, we graduate students felt that she had our backs through the transition. Um, she knew everyone's name, undergraduates, grad students. She knew everyone on a first name basis, and she helped people make friends by giving them things to talk about. Martha had a talent for bringing people together. Um, I remember attending uh, dinner events at her house and she would circulate to talk to people, um, check if they were having fun, or tell them to get more food or drinks, or tell us stories, or tell us about the dogs, or <laughs> encourage us to eat or drink more. Um, her joy was just so memorable, and it was not just her, but everyone involved was in a, a joyful situation. Um, these were extremely interesting international affairs, 
these parties. Um, whenever someone was uh, someone new in town as a visiting scholar, she would often host people at her house to stay there for a week or two. Um, there were always very interesting visitors from other departments, other institutions, and the socializing in such a happy atmosphere was uh, it had a way of bridging cultures. In 2001, a young Egyptian named Ramadan Hussein came as a graduate student to the Egyptology department. He was alone, having left his country for the first time in his life. And it was the first time he'd ever really traveled. So he was not entirely sure about anything that was going on. Um, he'd come from a poor neighborhood with unreliable postal service, and so he hadn't received his housing paperwork. And so he was left homeless on arrival. All he had were two suitcases and nowhere to go. So Professor Lesko asked Martha if he could stay at her house. Um, she gave him a place to live for what was supposed to be a week, and it turned into months. <laughs> she insisted she just liked having him there. Uh, Ramadan was a bit hapless at the beginning. Martha delighted in telling the story about how he put regular dish soap in the dishwasher of his first apartment and made a, big, a mess of the kitchen. Um, he had found there was, there was just so much to understand and navigate, all in a new language and system. Um, he was different from most of us. His life experience had been so unique. Um, but his, he, living at Martha's, he, there were always people to meet and to whom he could tell his story. Um, he'd come from a very poor neighborhood, a landscape of factories, where he'd never seen the stars until he went camping in the desert at 12 years old. He had illiterate parents who did not understand his passion for education and as a way to transform your circumstances. He was determined to show the world a new face for his people by being a legitimate talent without any colonialist condescension or reality show buffoonery. It was going to be a big job. And this is how most of us met him. Um, I met him at a party. I was newly home from a year abroad in Tubingen and a new doctoral candidate. Martha introduced Ramadan to the kitchen full of people at the gathering, um, and she remembered that I had studied in Egypt as an undergrad. Um, it had been a passion of mine that had led me to this field of archaeology, and so she told us to talk. <laughs> Taking Martha's lessons to heart, I thought that this young man could use some friends. In graduate school, everyone needs a support system. So I invited him to lunch. <laughs> After an email correspondence and telling Martha about it, we settled on a Tuesday. Uh, it would be a very different day than anyone had planned. This was September 11th, 2001. I thought of Ramadan, and I thought he would need some compassion. So I included the other archaeology graduate students in the outing. Um, compassion, we all agreed, was a good idea. I think I misinterpreted a little, because Ramadan almost seemed disappointed to see all of us. <laughs> In talking to Ramadan later, uh, he admitted that he had hoped it would be just the two of us. <laughs> Martha saw all, all of us headed out that day and stopped to talk to us. And I remember she finished the conversation with peace in our time. Ramadan told me another story about that day, uh, about what happened later. He said he spent the day in the library, because he had, but, but he had trouble concentrating. He was frustrated and saddened by what had happened. And here he was, trying to put a good face on his people, and some of his countrymen had been involved in something so terrible. He went back home, although he thought he would just stay up reading like he did most of the time. He really did. This man got locked in the Rockefeller twice after hours. <laughs> now that night, when Ram went home, um, although he was lonely, he didn't know where to turn for company. At home, he ha at, in Egypt, he had a big family, as well as neighbors and friends, and he'd known these people his whole life. Uh, he had colleagues and students. But this was a time when he did need friends and he didn't know where to turn. That night, Martha came to his rescue. She and Artie invited him to their room to watch a movie with the dogs. <laughs> Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, he said it was. <laughs> there they sat, being together in their sadness, and he said that memory was one of the happiest of his life. He said that it taught him that he could have friends who were so different from him in terms of life and experience and circumstance. They could be like family, and the love between them made that possible. It made us possible, too, because he did finally get that date with me. <laughs> I like that as a lesson that she taught me. Don't let people feel like they don't have support. Keep people by you. Don't let them feel alone. I took that on as a graduate student, trying to make sure that everyone that wanted to have a place, that we did things together and became real friends. Several of you are here today. 
Uh, who could forget the future director of the Deutsches Archäologisches Institut, Walter Trilmisch, with his spectacular bowling stance when he was visiting us? Or the Halloween party she threw for us in her basement where she was dressed in a lovely galabea. Um, Christian and Emily were there. <laughs> then uh, Ramadan and I wanted to get married. Martha gave us a place to. She knew that we both came from really poor backgrounds and that this was something we were both somewhat hiding here. Um, when you grow up like we did, you, you don't want to be judged for what you can't provide. And it was a big part of what brought Ramadan and myself together was that um, no one else seemed to have clued into the similarity. But Martha didn't even give Ramadan a chance to say anything, but instead organized the entire wedding celebration. <laughs> People are here who remember uh, the bridal shower with the belly dancing lessons. <laughs> Martha didn't even pose for any pictures. She took them all because she didn't want it to be about her. She threw together the kind of wedding that people like me have only seen on TV. It was so beautiful and I've never felt more a part of the Brown community as I did being Martha's friend. At the wedding, Martha tried to get Ramadan to dance. He would not. <laughs> but you could see she was really happy for him the way she hugged him from behind and forced him to sway. <laughs> I'm not even sure I realized it until we brought the wedding photos to Egypt, how Ramadan had really um, impressed his family who couldn't be there. His mom had lots of prayers and about how lucky he was to have people in his new home who loved him. Martha knew how important it is in Ramadan's culture to impress. Um, he had gone off to Brown to become someone important and successful. And when he talked about this, even years later, he would get choked up. He said he would never be able to repay the kindness. He felt so valued and loved because of Martha's belief in him. And she was the person who really got him. His own mother could never understand his accomplishments or what they meant. But Martha had become a sort of mom in his second life. Martha helped me too. She gave me my first job teaching a semester at the New Joukowsky Institute. It was a respectable first job. Later she hired me to do research assisting on the Petra project for a fall semester. We used to spend our mornings together working on Petra material and where many research assisting jobs will minimize the contributions of a researcher or leave their names off altogether, Martha gave me full credit for my work. After her retirement, we all stayed in touch while Martha was in Providence. Through the birth of our son Yusuf, Martha warned Ramadan about diaper changing. She said, if it's a boy, it goes right in your face. <laughs> so, she was in town for Ramadan's doctoral defense, which she attended. Um, there were dinners with Hastings, so spaghetti and steak. In 2009, we moved our family to Egypt so Ramadan could take a job with the Supreme Council of Antiquities. In 2010, Martha and Artie came on a brown tour of Egypt. Ramadan was there to facilitate, to get people special permission to come in and see things, get, get up close and personal with the Sphinx, for instance. We got to tell her about our expected arrivals. Arrivals, plural, the twins, Ben and Martha. She was able to meet her little namesake only once when we were home from Egypt. Um, the revolution in 2011 brought us back to the States. Over the years, she kept up correspondence with my dad. He would, write what, he would write to her whenever we had good news. He liked sharing good news. Um, Ramadan went back to Brown a few years ago and stayed with Martha and Artie. He said it was like coming home. He got his old room back, even. Yeah. Ram didn't tell her he was sick the last time they spoke. After Artie died, he called her. He didn't want to worry her with his own problems. And I wish right now that I had just one of them to help me get through the grief of the other. However, I remain honored to be here and to be able to come here to tell you all about my friend and the enormous part that she played in shaping the person that I want to be. And many different things she was, we all could stand to be more like her. Thank you. Our next crier and storyteller is Jarrett LaBelle. 
Jarrett is the editor in chief of Archaeology Magazine. We also, they're like a lot of marriages and things <laughs> that, 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 that have some connection. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> please, Jarrett. <clears throat> Um, I just, before I start my um, prepared remarks, I want to say, because I think Martha would want me to, that we will all miss Ramadan greatly. <laughs> and that as a Brown family, we will always be here for you in this department and anywhere else that you ever need us. <laughs> I would like to thank President Paxson, Peter Van Domlin, and Sarah Sharp, and the entire Joukowsky Institute for asking me to be a small part of this distinguished group of speakers and friends and colleagues. <laughs> the best way to start, as everybody has, is always to share a story. But how do you possibly tell a story about someone who always had the best stories in the room? We have heard some wonderful, wonderful stories, and we'll no doubt hear many more, about tea time and weddings at Martha and Artie's glorious house on Prospect Street the archaeologically named dogs she loved so dearly, Dushara, and there was a Pompey and a Caesar. Her kindness, generosity, enthusiasm, her extraordinary experiences in the field, and I will add a few more here. One of my favorite Martha stories has always been how she talked about Lebanon, where she lived from 1961 to 1972. She looked back so fondly on her time in this country, not yet rent by civil war, and one of the moments she would recount was sitting by the water at a fabulous outdoor cafe and the sound of everybody's DuPont lighter, lighter, of course, <laughs> closing, a very particular soft and satisfying click, much more elegant than the scratching of a Bic or the heavy thud of a Zippo. After hearing that story, I really wanted one of those lighters, which are made in France where Martha received her PhD from the Sorbonne and are beautifully enameled in bright colors. It was easy to imagine her there as the sun set over the Mediterranean, and I thought having a, one of those lighters would make me a little more like Martha, the archaeologist I had wanted to be since I was six years old. Martha told me this story shortly after I was a freshman in the introductory archaeology class. <laughs> she taught with, at that time, Ross Holloway and Mary Hollinshead, who I see here today, another woman archaeologist, to whom I also owe a great debt and thank you for challenging me to be a better writer. She was a tough editor then, and I'm a tough editor now. <laughs> so, without Mary and Martha, I would not be the editor-in-chief of Archaeology Magazine today. So thank you, Mary. <laughs> I went to a very small, very nurturing, all-girls school for 12 years before college, and thus really had never been in a position to think girls were in any way not able to achieve everything they wanted to. But college is different. It was co-ed and a little intimidating, and classics and archaeology at the time seemed, at least to me, to be a lot of men. As opposed to now, where there are so many women in both fields, in great part thanks to Martha and to women like her. But Martha's superior teaching, support, and inspiration allowed me to overcome any securities I may have had, and I was often running, fulfilling my lifelong dream of becoming an archaeologist, just like Martha. Martha was president of the Archaeological Institute of America when I was in college and taking her classes, and this gave me a lot of confidence that I too could be an archaeologist. Little did either of us know that I would end up working for the Archaeological Institute of America for now 24 years. <laughs> just knowing her, especially at this point in her career and mine, made me always feel just a little bit more special. Martha also taught me that archaeology was not just about sites and buildings and sculptures, but about how to look at a text critically and think about how it relates to the culture that created it. Lessons that served me well in every class I took at Brown or graduate school and that are at the core of what I do at the magazine. Telling the stories of the past is what I and my wonderful colleagues do every day. And Martha was the best storyteller and brought the people of the past to life. And I wanted to be just like Martha. Martha came to archaeology's offices in New York many years later and for her to see me at my desk, surrounded by archaeology magazines, dozens of which I had helped to create, and to tell me that she was proud of me was one of the best moments I can recall. Martha wanted the field of archaeology to be accessible to anyone who was interested, and that deeply influenced my decision to work for the magazine and share my passion for the past with devoted archaeology lovers, just like Martha. 
Every time that I saw her until her passing, which was many times over the years, Martha always asked me how things were going at the magazine. She never forgot that I worked there and what stories I was working on. And she always let me know she was there if I needed her. Somehow, she always remembered the last thing you told her and made you feel like the most important person in the room. She would run across the room, in fact, this room, <laughs> filled with everyone clamoring her attention, with her arms stretched wide, the biggest smile on her face, and a loving greeting of Jarrett in a voice I cannot possibly imitate, but which I can still hear, and of which I will never lose the memory. As some of you may have read, I was privileged to be asked to write the necrology for Martha for the current volume of the American Journal of Archaeology. While doing research for this article, I was overwhelmed by the variety of places Martha lived and worked. Lebanon, China, Greece, and of course her beloved Petra. Some of which were countries that may not necessarily have welcomed her as a woman archaeologist. But Martha was fearless and quickly won over both her colleagues and the local people. She was always a sterling example of how to treat people in the field and respect for local cultures, lessons that were invaluable to me when I became the co-director of a very large field school, very large, <laughs> in Pompeii. And by no small wonderful coincidence, considering Martha's impact on women archaeologists, one of our other speakers today, Emily Egan, was my student at that very field school where she met her husband and where I met my husband. <laughs> Martha had encouraged me to apply to the excavation as a student in the first place, instead perhaps of going with her to Petra because she knew Pompeii was the right place for me. Being a woman in a world full of men, from the custodians to bank managers and in fact the superintendents in Pompeii, I knew I could all handle it all, just like Martha. Of course, Martha also dug in much less glamorous locations we've heard about, such as the very cold and dusty basement of the Center for Old World Archaeology and Art on Waterman Street where she arranged mock excavations so her students would be ready to go into the field with proper techniques, especially with regard to the pottery sherds she thought were the most important artifacts any archaeologist can study. This despite uncovering an entire enormous temple lined with the elephant-headed capitals, a replica of which you see outside this building today. I know many of you will recall that basement lined with plaster replicas of the Parthenon marbles with affection or maybe a little horror but even there, Martha was cheerful and encouraging and enthusiastic, displaying a passion for archaeology fueled by her passion for her students that never waned. When I became editor-in-chief of archaeology, I thanked many people in my first editor's letter, some of whom are here today and many of whom were professors when I was at Brown. First and foremost in my mind was Martha. For me, as for Martha and Artie, Brown is a special place and a place of family. Beyond her work, which Martha loved, Martha was always devoted to her family, whom she adored. And my family is here today to acknowledge what Martha meant to me in my personal and professional life. It is really quite extraordinary for me to be here in this room, in this beautiful building that Martha and Artie donated, in the very same place, quite literally, the very same place where my husband Jason defended his dissertation from the very institute that Martha and Artie founded. He was also, incidentally, the last student from the Center for Old World Archaeology and Art, another unbreakable link to Martha. She was the bridge between the two incarnations of archaeology at Brown, and as she still is, between me and Jason. I know Martha would also want me to acknowledge another woman without whom I would not be here, and whom she met on several occasions. My mother, who always asked me about Martha because she knew just how much I loved her, passed away nearly one month to the day after Martha did. In successive archaeology magazine editor's letter, I wrote about these women who never failed to encourage and support me in every way they could. We are not the women we are without the women in our lives. Very few people in the world achieve the status such that they can be referred to only by their first name. But to everyone who was ever fortunate enough to be close to her, she was and will always be just Martha because no one else could ever fill those shoes or wear those improbably huge highly impractical gold scalloped earrings into the field because there really was nobody just like Martha. Thank you. How fitting for Martha, how many of us are willing to expose our own pain and sadness even beyond her. Our last speaker this 
afternoon, evening, um, is Ellie Power, Assistant Professor in the Department of Methodology at the London School of Economics. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for, for having us here, and thank you to Martha and Artie and all their family and friends and loved ones here. Um, I am, save one who also is in this room, I think the last student of Martha. Uh, so I think it's fitting that I came here at the end. And you will hear echoes of basically everyone in the stories that I'll be trying to tell, tell us all here. Um, I met Martha also, technically, before I even arrived at Brown. Uh, I had signed up for a first year seminar, the Archaeology of Anatolia. We all know this one now. Um, and so that meant that she was my first year mentor. And I had sent her an email, a very overlong, over eager email <laughs> before even arriving, telling her with much seriousness that I was committed to archaeology. I had just done a gap year where I had worked at multiple archaeological excavations, and that therefore qualified me to be whatever the hell she wanted me to be. I would work for her for free. I would scrub her dishes. I would do whatever opportunity that she had for me. If she needed a research assistant, I was there for her in whatever capacity she would take me. And she, I think, sent some very cordial response, which said, uh, find me after class. <laughs> so I, I did. <laughs> I found her after that class. I need to unlock my phone. I um, walked from my dorm in Pembroke, um, from Andrews Hall, up to uh, the, the class where, where I was, was going to be meeting her. I was, of course, bowled away by that very first lecture and all the examples she gave us in that moment and was wildly intimidated to go up to her after that class. But she invited me home. And not long after, I was going to be working for her as a research assistant. My timing happened to be completely inopportune. Apparently, her line about uh, not taking freshmen with her uh, is actually just a complete farce. And she, <laughs> for those overeager ones who uh, will not take no for an answer, she finds a way. And she found a way for so very many of us. Um, so I, while Emily was in the basement, very, the very cool Emily with the crisp uh, also floating in the wings, I would walk up every day from my dorm in, in Andrews Hall. Twice a week, I would go over to Martha's house and uh, up the back entrance into her office with all the animatronic animals. And I came to know Petra first through all of the trench reports. What she tasked me with was trying to create an overall phasing of the, of, of the, of the different trenches of the site. And so I came to know it in this abstract way first, but through the affection with Martha and Artie and all of the students that were there, felt that I had this intimacy to the place. I would every day be taking full cups of coffee in the diner-sized carafe of coffee, which lived fully there always, along with the peanut M&Ms there and ready for the students to, to avail themselves of. If I was lucky, I got a BLT made by Jill. I think many of us sustained ourselves from the food that existed in that house, ready for all of us there to, to take on. And um, it was simply <laughs> a remarkable time where we came to know Martha and her love and the space she created. I then, thankfully, having learned of Petra um, in the abstract, then got to go there from freshman year on. Thank God for that. I don't. I mean, my time in Petra in Brown is inextricable from my time in Petra and with with the Jakowskis. And I would, you know, I was. I got to be a trench supervisor too. I mean, <laughs> the, the the the. It was truly wild. I mean, the what I think Martha gave to to so many of us was just the. Um, a confidence. She had a confidence in us and an expectation that we would rise to the occasion, and we therefore did. We, we simply did. She created that space, and we took to it. She would, you know, command around the archaeological site in her khaki getup with her cap, her general's cap with the spaghetti on the top. And uh, she would march around and, you know, look down on, on the, on, you know, weigh in on the different trenches and how they were coming along. And we would feel 
never a sense of doubt or trepidation about that, but just here was someone who was giving us advice and guidance and supporting us in what we were doing, and we were all getting along as a, as a, as a team and working with one another to excavate this. As an undergraduate, I mean, there were obviously graduate students there who also came to the excavation, but the level of respect and import that she imbued in her students from the start was simply unrivaled, and it never occurred to me that that confidence could ever be misplaced. There was just a confidence. I think, um, you know, <laughs> there are ways in which academia can be backbiting and, and tough and uh, difficult, but that was never the case for uh, the community that Martha came and built around her, the students that came to her. It was one of, always of support and warmth where we just simply understood that we would rise to the occasion. We wanted to make sure that we could uh, you know, live up to the expectations that she had for us, and, and we, we just simply did that. Sometimes that seems truly wild. I had a key to her house within months of being her student, and I was not the only one. We've heard what's in that house. <laughs> I mean, I, I probably, if I, yeah, that, that's, uh, <laughs> That was maybe a decision she shouldn't have <laughs> she shouldn't have made, but it was also never a problem. That was that basement was open for for all of us to use, and that community and richness was there um, for all of her students as something we took for granted. That was you know within weeks of my arriving at Brown, I had, I understood that this is what a Brown education was like. I yes now realize that is not <laughs> that is not the case, but I am ever <laughs> ever grateful that that was the experience that I was able to have. Uh, you know, in Petra too, uh, there were times she had important people to see and had to run off to, to do one thing or another, and we would just be left in charge uh, with the expectation that we would be fine with that. You know, she would say, don't go down that, that cistern. We had, you know, returned to find that we probably had done, but that was fine. That was fine. <laughs> Nothing was damaged in the process, as far as we know. The, you know, the, we, we, did, we did the work, and it was, a, you know, archaeologists have a reputation. Archaeological digs have a reputation. We were remarkably cogent and coherent, and, you know, there weren't tiffs. There weren't uh, crises. Uh, we got on. We did the work. We tried to live up to the confidence that Martha brought uh, to us. She had um, a seriousness to her, which I think we all aspired to, but it was tinged with this humor. If she called you a dead loss, that was the highest praise. <laughs> I am disappointed that she did not call me a dead loss more often. <laughs> I'm jealous of some of the other people around here who got that nomer. And it was, uh, you know, that's, we, we tried to give the love, the, the tough love that she gave us right back to her. We um, tried to complement her khaki fatigues with a bandolier filled with lighters so she would stop stealing everybody else's lighters. Uh, she wore that with uh, real style, I would say. Um, she, you know, took, took us as we were. She, she gave us the confidence. We would bring her gifts of uh, Galois cigarettes that she could give to everybody else. We brought her as much uh, pink grapefruit juice as we could possibly find throughout uh, Amman and from every duty-free airport that we could, that we could bring with, uh, with us so that she could have all of those things. We, you know, we're a scraggly bunch, many of us, but we tried our best with true diligence at the annual 4th of July uh, Brown Bears versus Petra Scorpions softball game where Artie was always the pitcher. We generally lost, but we tried, <laughs> and, and I think that's what exactly, you know, she expected and, and hoped for us. I think um, in all of these ways, in both Petra and in Providence, Martha just gave us space to be ourselves. She gave us support. She gave us a haven that was physical, obviously. I also stayed in her, in her house on many occasions. She literally clothed me once. Uh, she, of course, decided, she and Artie, that I should accompany them to, while I was staying with them over some break, to a, um, a dinner, a very fancy dinner that they were having, and whatever I had in my suitcase was not up to snuff. Uh, so I ended up going in some combination of, you know, a 
top from Martha and some of Artie's penny loafer shoes, uh, because those were going to be <laughs> what best suited the occasion. I thought I looked all right. Uh, they, they thought I at least looked passable, and were happy to, you know, instead of saying, no, little student, you stay here at home, they were more than happy to have me go out to their fancy dinner with all of the uh, bigwigs in my whatever getup I happened to be wearing at the time. So Martha gave us this haven that was physical too, but yes, more than that, I think really emotional, and I think that's shown through here in so much of what we were saying. She gave us a confidence because she had confidence in us. So I was fully confident that it was totally reasonable for me to be flying solo to Jordan as a freshman. I was fully confident driving the Toyota Hilux days after having barely gotten my driver's license, <laughs> not really knowing how to drive stick to and from the site with the back of the truck laden with equipment and also many of the team members. That was fine, that was fine. I was fully confident to be dangling out of the uh, military helicopter that at the end of each season, uh, the Jordanian government let us fly around the site to take aerial photographs. Artie, of course, was always the one as the site photographer who was dangling out the, the open door of the army helicopter, uh, taking all these photos. And one year, because of the uh, trench that I was the supervisor of being fancy enough, that year I got to sit next to him, tethered in by the slightest of metal wires. But that was absolutely fine. We were confident in that. We knew we had the support and love and the care of Martha and Artie there with us. And so we simply rose to that. And I think that confidence is something that, again, in academia is something that very easily gets beaten out of people. They have those doubts. And I don't think you see that in the women here, nor do I think you see that in any of the students that came into the orbit of Martha and Artie. They just simply didn't. It wasn't something that could be conceived of. Martha had that confidence in her, and she assumed that it would be there in her students as well. And so we did. Uh, we did have that confidence, and that was a confidence to just do what we saw in the world that we wanted to do. So I'm not an archaeologist anymore. There is an intellectual line that bridges me back to Martha. It was really questions that I encountered uh, in the first course that I took with her on the archaeology of Anatolia. I was interested in religion and the role that religion played and some of the major transitions in human history. And I turned to want to study that um, as an anthropologist rather than an archaeologist. And that, too, was a, was a bold move to set out on, on my own, but I did it with the confidence that Martha instilled in me and with the support that she placed in me. And so I think more than that intellectual through line is really that grounding that she gave to so many of us to pursue whatever we felt that we should be pursuing. And for that, I will always, always be grateful. I think many more of us have stories that we would like to tell about Martha, so <laughs> I will uh, leave it at that, and thank you all. Thank you. I, you know, the stories, Laurel, Emily, Angela, Jarrett, Eleanor, amazing stories, and so many people in the room I know have more stories about Artie and Martha that we can share. I, I think what I'd love to do now is uh, break. We have a reception set out. We have a lot of time to talk, and I encourage people really to talk about their stories about these two amazing people. And, you know, I guess my, the one thing I would conclude with is you told the story of a professor who is unparalleled. <laughs> Can I cry too? Yes. <laughs> no, it's just, it makes me proud, really proud. So thank you. <laughs>